Welcome back! <clears throat> so excited. I have the whole house to myself. Got my, my son off at daycare. Everyone's working or in school. Um, so one of those rare occasions where I have peace and quiet. So welcome to tea time on turn seven. And we're going to jump right back into where we left off. So we are now on, we're still talking about the Coma Cosmos Serpent deck. We left off on Machine God's Effigy. And now we're on to Extravagant Replication. So let's jump into Extravagant Replication. It's at the beginning of your, it's an enchantment for six. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a token that's a copy of another target non-land permanent you control. So you can cop anything but a land, um, which I always find interesting. Like that would be such a cool way for blue to ramp. Um, you know, having having interesting interesting ways for, or even even to just like help the game to where you don't miss land drops would be a cool a cool way to do things, but. Um, so at the beginning of your upkeep, create a token that's a copy of another target non-land permanent you control. So, um, there, that, there's so many things that you can pick for this. Uh, I mean, obviously, right. But just to, just to kind of look at the things that we could pick. So if we've, if we've gotten one of our, where we've created a token, that is not a legendary version of Coma or Adrix. We can copy those. Um, Progenitor Mimic would, would obviously be really awesome. Mirror Box would actually be really awesome too, potentially. Let me see. Each legendary creature you, you control gets plus one, plus one. Each non-token creature you control gets plus one, plus one for each other creature you control with the same name. Each non-token creature. That's interesting. Um... So we, we kind of need to jump ahead a little bit to get the really cool stuff. And I was kind of referring to stuff like Orvar, the all form, um, his way of ramping in blue. It's kind of a, I, I, I think it's cool. I think it's fine. I don't think it's, it's too over the top, but what we could do, we could, we could copy, um, well, at this point in the game, if you have the six mana to cast this, you may or may not necessarily need more mana, so you might not necessarily care about Birds of Paradise or Ricks with Bees, um, Merrileaf, Overgrown Battlement, um, but you might copy things like Paradox Haze. If you have a Paradox Haze, oh wait. Oh wait. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Hold on. Hold, hold the phone. This is why I love decks like this. I feel like this would be right. I might just be dumb. Let's find out. Let's just, like, it helps me to just get it in play. Uh, so we have Paradox Ace. And then we have Extravagant. Okay. <sighs> okay. So... You have, you have this, let's say you have this, and then during your turn, you, you play this. You pass a turn, comes back around to you, and now it says at the beginning of your upkeep, create a token that's a copy of another target non-land permanent you control. So you target the Paradox Haze, that resolves creating a Paradox Haze, and then, and then you resolve your upkeep. But now, at the beginning of each enchanted player's first upkeep each turn, that player gets an additional upkeep. It is cumulative, right? Because you would get one for each uh, multiple Paradox Haze. trigger x time once per yeah so oh but it but it triggers at the beginning of your at the beginning of enchanted players first upkeep each turn 
that player gets an additional upkeep step after this one. Beginning of enchantment player's first upkeep. So I think that part where it says at the beginning of enchanted player's first upkeep would so yeah, because so let's let's just do this. Paradox. Uh man. Someday I'll have a computer that the USB ports are absolute trash. Paradox is an extravagant. Right, that's that's what makes sense to me. So what you could do this So it, so so it triggers at, on the first upkeep and you get an additional upkeep. So then you could because this is at the beginning of your upkeep, so as many upkeeps as you have, you would you could do this. I hope that makes sense, right? So you have this. Your turn begins. Untap, upkeep. Upkeep, you get a trigger. You get a trigger of Paradox Haze. This is the stack. And then... So you could copy... You could copy this. And then, so you make one, and then it goes to your additional upkeep, at which point this triggers again, but this does not. These will not trigger again because it's not your first upkeep. And then you could copy it again. So if you have things that benefit from additional upkeeps, so, but again, this only, tr so now, now I have three, so this turn, I had two upkeeps, and next turn, I'll have four upkeeps. And, and I could make more of these. I could make more of them, and then it would go, it, it's not infinite, but it would go around to the next time, and then I would have my normal upkeep plus however many Paradox Hazes I have, which in this case is six. So again, if you have things like, so this says, at the beginning of your upkeep, create a token that's a copy of another target non-land permanent you control. So this says at the beginning of your upkeep, create a token. So we've already talked about this, but we'll talk about it again. If we have Adrix and Nev, if we have, I feel like my keyboard is like on, because I put, I put my keyboard on, top of my laptop keyboard. So sometimes it presses buttons um, just because it's sitting on it. So here, so if an effect would put one or more tokens on the battlefield under control, it puts twice that many of those. So if this is in play, or if this is in play, or both of these are in play, then it's cumulative. So if it would put in, if it would put in one token, it would be two. And I know we talked about this last time. If we have both of these, then it would be four. And then if we had an additional, it would be eight. So then we would now have 10 upkeeps. So that's pretty, that's pretty gross in a, like a really awesome way. That's fun. Um, yeah, it's that it's that one word of it saying first. That makes it where you can't just make like an indefinite amount of um in in infinite amount of upkeeps, which would be fun, especially in this deck. So uh let's see. So the other things that we could I don't think molt let me let me see this. Well it wouldn't matter, right? Dismiss. Yeah, wouldn't matter. So I'm trying to think, um, so let's go here and we have Paradox Haze, we have Storm of Saruman, Storm of Saruman. So this is Ward 3, whenever you cast your second spell each turn, copy it. 
except the copy isn't legendary. You may choose new targets for the copy. Um, so we could we could copy that with extravagant. So so we can see like this is legitimate jank, right? As, like getting a six mana cost out to copy another six mana cost to just make more copies of things. Um, Gilded Drake, perplexing, perplexing Chimera. So I, I think like we understand that extravagant replication is a thing and what it does. That's that's really all we need to know without like spoiling things that we haven't got to yet. So Bramble Soft Bramble Sovereign. This one's okay. I'll be honest. Like this is a card that I'm like, do I just take this out for something maybe? But Something I'll caution you guys on is I would encourage you not to just look at a card and be like, this card is good or this card is bad. Because a lot of cards, you are you don't really get a good feel for them until you actually play them in games. So something that um, I was struggling to explain... Uh, for Adam's Anala deck, he had. Let me look at what that card's called. So it's a draw. It's in the draw category. Is this Anala? Yeah. Um, I think it's this one, Volo. So, so Volo, Volo. Yeah. So this one says when Volo enters the battlefield, create a journal. Volo create Volo's journal, a legendary colorless artifact token with hexproof. And it says, whenever you cast a creature spell, note one of the creature types that hasn't been noted for this artifact yet. Then you can pay to tap Volo, draw a card for each creature type noted for target permanent you control named Volo's journal. So, so Volo has to stay alive, which is a downfall, but, you know, it's, it is what it is. And then... And I'm thinking, right? So when Vola enters the battlefield, so let's just let's just kind of play this out for an Anala. So again, Anala, she. I know I'm getting off topic, but whatever. It's it's my series. Just deal with it, right? So. So Anala has Eminence. Whenever you play a Wizard, you can pay a colorless mana. If you do, you can make a copy of that Wizard. It has haste, and then you exile it at the beginning of the next end step. So if you were like further in the game, let's just grab, let's just grab, we're gonna we'll grab the islands. Okay, so play, play. Let's say like you're quite a ways into the game. Did I grab seven? Yeah. Maybe I did. I think I did. Yeah. So you you have you have these these mini lands and you know probably some artifacts or you know mana rocks whatever. You play this dude. He comes into play. You pay one. You get a token that's a copy of him. Oh, that's right because he's legendary. So I guess you really couldn't do that awesome sauce. That's too bad. Not not to you like I'm still standing strong that it's a good like it's a a decent draw card. I don't think it's an amazing draw card, don't get me wrong, but I do think it's a very good draw card. I think uh you can get multiple creatures written into that book and then you can tap pay to tap him and draw three four five six cards a turn easily um but he's convinced that it's not that it's that it's like pretty trash but he has yet so what to get back on topic what i'm saying is I think it's a good card. I've play tested the card. I got a lot of draw out, out of it during my turn seven sol solitaire play tests of it. I think it's totally fine. Um, and he 
has disregarded it before he's ever gotten it on the table and actually played it and got draw out of it. So, so, so he's saying it's a bad card, but he, how do you know that if you haven't played it in a game, if you haven't like got it on the table and seen whether it was useless or not? So that's, that's all I'm saying is like, you'll be pleasantly surprised for sure if you, if you play some cards that you're not sure about. And then I'd say a lot of times it, cards will tend to like overperform. Like if you think they're not going to be that good and then, they, and then they're actually really, really good. But Magic is a game that you can't really know that because there's trillions, billions, infinite amounts of, of ways that the card could interact with other cards in the game because there's so many. And you have three other opponents doing three different things. Everybody's doing different stuff. And that, that card could be awesome. It could be awesome. This is a great example of what I'm talking about because Bramble Sovereign to me I'm like maybe like it looks okay but if we if we actually have it on the table in a game it's a 4-4 four, for four, 4 whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield you can pay 2 if you do that creature's controller creates a token that's a copy of that creature so to me I think there's a lot of things you could do that would make that really fun um because I like to be, you know, I, it, I play for, I play for the, what do they call this? Bor what do they call it? Vorthos? Like the, excuse me. <coughs> for like the big, fun, splashy, crazy play. Um, clever, you know, jank, right? So if you're playing for that, then you could, you could totally have, um, you could you could be making copies for opponents creatures like they play something that you're like oh this would be really funny to make a copy of right so like something that might be like that would be like um, you know something where it's like opponents draw a card at the end step or something like that I mean if if you're if you're not just trying to do something that's like kind of just ridiculous. Then you could, you could do that. Um, so what I think about for a card like this is, so the deck has, the deck has cards like Cryptolith Rite and Mana. Oh, what is it? Elven, Elvish, Elven Chorus or something like that. Okay, I don't know why it's not ringing it up. Maybe I spelled it wrong. Um, but it is. Where are you? Kind of. So if you have Cryptolith right out or Elven Chorus or you know a plethora of the other things that, that make a lot of mana and you have Coma out, it's done one rotation of the table. So we, so we get a Coma Coil. So we have four Coma Coils. Now, of course, this one, one of these would have summoning sickness, so really three. But now you could do, when you play something, you could do, um, you have extra mana to just throw into this, if that makes sense. I know I'm not making, like, a great point. I'm just trying to think of, like, interesting ways that you could play this card. I think it has, I think it definitely has potential, but I just don't know if it's good yet. So, who knows, after, after I play play it in you know three or four games or two or three games depending on how I really feel about it maybe it stays maybe it goes um, all right spitting image spitting image is so good in this deck very 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 good this card is so good okay so spitting image is a sorcery for four and either you know, any combination of green and blue. It says, put a token into play. That's a copy of target creature. 
and then it has retrace. You may play this card from your graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying its other costs. When this deck gets going easily, easily, and you'll see when we actually do like the turn seven solitaire um, plays, and I got to play the deck uh, a couple times over the weekend with my sons, you end up with so much draw in this deck you draw so many cards that you there's no way you could even play all of the lands that you're going to have in your hand so having a card like this that you could just keep throwing a land and making a token and again if we have our token doublers so so if i have a copy if i have coma coil and i have a sakashima of a thousand faces of coma coil and then i, I cast this on that and I have like an Adrix and Nev, or I have a Parallel Lives or something. I make, I make two more copies of Coma. Then this goes to the grave. I br I just pitch a land, pay mana, and I could get two more copies of this guy. Does that make sense? So so like, it can get crazy. You you can you could cast this over and over and over and over and over and over and over as long as you have the mana for it and you'll you'll have the lands for it just because of the way that the deck draws and because of the way that the deck is again it's not it's definitely not unheard of to have several coma coils like several coma coils like 20 and then if you have a cryptolith right uh that's 20 mana right there alone so it's super easy to cast this multiple times. So Spitting Image is very, 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 very good in this deck. It's very good. Um, Stolen Identity. So this is where I get a little bit off the beaten path. This is a, it's a great card by itself. But the reason that I put it in is just because I, I'm running Orvar. And I'm running Orvar for no other reason than to just run Orvar. <laughs> I honestly don't think Orvar is like that great of a card unless you're so just to talk about Orvar briefly. So if, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about Orvar, this is Orvar. He's a legendary shapeshifter changeling three, three for four, three and a blue. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, if it targets one or more other permanents you control, create a token that's a copy of one of those permanents. So this guy is really great and this card i actually it's not because i was looking into orvar that i discovered this card this card my brother played in a 60 card deck that was oh gosh i'm trying to remember the theme of the deck but it was like a it was a it was it was a really interesting deck but so he found um hidden strings so hidden strings is a cipher Sorcery for two. You may tap or untap target permanent. Then you may tap or untap another target permanent. And then you cipher this onto any creature. So then anytime that creature deals combat damage to a player, you get to cast it again. So what people do is... Is when they have Orvar, they cast it in strings, and then they target the uh an island to tap it or untap it and then because they're targeting a permanent you get to create a token of that permanent so you get to make another one right so again this is a token so if you do this and you have parallel lives adrix and nav you can get you can get multiples of them right so now you're you're doing this kind of interesting way of ramping in blue that's kind of unique it's Pretty unique to Orvar as far as I've seen. I'm, I'm sure there's probably some other ways to do this, but this is uh, this is the, the 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 only one that I've really seen. So then, if you hit somebody with combat damage, you get to do this again. Tap or on, so so again. If I cast, you know, if I cast a spell, let's say a counter spell, and then I hit somebody, I can. Tap or untap a target permanent, and then I can tap or untap another target permanent. And then you can create, so whenever you cast an or sorcery, if it targets one or more other permanents, you control, create a token, so then I can create a token. 
because Cypher, so after you play this, then you exile it and encode it onto a creature you control. So, so it's like it's in exile, but it's encoded on this on this creature. So Cypher. So every time this creature deals combat damage to a player, I get to cast that spell again. And so for an Orvar the All Form deck, what I found was like you really have to kind of build it in the meta way for it to do really well. And it does really, really well um, if you build it in that like EDH rec version. But I personally couldn't find a really, really cool way to to make like a unique Orvar the All Form deck. But I really like the card, so I put it into my coma just for fun, just to just to mess around with it, play around with it, see what it does. May or may not stay. May or may not stay. And so, stolen identity. Let me grab that again. So, stolen identity. This is a sorcery for six. Put a token on the battlefield that's a copy of target artifact or creature. So you could so so you could you could cast it. What I did the other night is because I had um, my son played the Ur Dragon, and then he played Sakashima of a Thousand Faces on the Ur Dragon. So I copied his Sakashima of a Thousand Faces version of the Ur Dragon. So then I had an Ur Dragon. that ignored legendary and then i went to combat and then i got to cast this again and i was able to copy the air dragon a second time and then every turn you can do that so now i wonder too let's find this out if a creature is copied and it had cypher Won't be encoded. You see, I think I looked at it before and that was the case, so I didn't think that was gonna happen. Uh, Missouri's Predation. This is a, it's a board wipe, kind of. In this deck, I don't... So, so this is the thing, right? This is my control package here. So these are the cards that I'm saying, like, these are in the deck to be the control package. But you can have cards that are in what the deck wants to do that's that is also a draw card or a ramp card or a control package-esque card. This doesn't mean that you can't put control package type cards here. It, this, this, this just means these are all the things that want to do what the deck wants to do. So Azuri's Predation creates tokens, right? So it's, it's expensive. It's three green, five and three green. For each creature your opponents control, put a 4-4 green beast creature token onto the battlefield. Each of those beasts fight a different one of those creatures. So what I'm excited to do, because this, this deck, like any good Simic deck, gets a lot of mana. So like we should be able to do this. Um, the jank version of this is... And we've already, uh, we've already talked about it once... We'll talk about it again. And this is what this is kind of what you want to talk about when you're making a deck is like multiple cards working in multiple ways with multiple like the same cards in your deck. So like you so like if this works with ten other cards in my deck or fifteen other cards in my deck, um then it then that's synergy, right? That's optimizing the deck. That's like you don't just want to have this in the deck just to work with um, second harvest. You want it to work with Azuri's predation. You want it to work with uh, multiple other cards, um, Adrix and Neb, for it to really you know to to really get a ton of value out of it. So so it works with multiple things. But this is the dream. Your opponents have you know this one's got three creatures. This opponent has five creatures. This opponent has four creatures. And so you get to make a 4-4 beast token for each of those for each of those things. So he's got four, three, or 
five, three, three, four, and five. So, so three, and then actually, I, we'll just do it like this. I don't want to make this more complicated than it needs to be. So, it really be five and three, whatever. We're just gonna put a number. You guys are like, you're adding it up. I am. I'm trying. So eleven. <laughs> we go with twelve. So I get 12 beast creature tokens that are going, and each of those beasts fight a different one of those creatures. I wonder, though, it should. But anyways, um, choose a target non-legendary creature. So if I have a Sakashima of a Thousand Faces or multitude of the other non-legendary versions of Cosmo, and I've played this, and then I play this, then... All 12 of these are going to enter as. All of these are going to enter as a copy of Cosmo instead, which is obviously really freaking awesome. And then, uh, and then I think those, it should say those copies, but it says those beasts. Missouri's Predation and Mystical Reflection. The created sto tokens still fight. Okay, see, that's what I thought, but I just... You never know with those little interesting... Um, if an object... If an ability of an object uses a phrase as this something to identify an object where something is a characteristic is referring to that particular object, even if it isn't the appropriate characteristic at the time. So, so it referred... Okay, yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. So sweet. So it comes in as all these 6-6 six, six, um, Cosmo Serpents, and they fight everything. Or whatever whatever it is that you want to copy. Because this, Mystic Reflection, the next time one or more creatures or Planeswalkers enters the battlefield this turn, they enter as copies of the chosen creature. So if you're making multiple tokens, they could they could enter as whatever. And it's, t and it's target... Uh, Choose target non legendary creature. So, so it doesn't have to be one of your creatures. It could be it could be somebody else's creatures, which is awesome. We talked about Orvar the All Form, Elven Chorus, Parallel Lives, um, Elven Forest. Sorry, Elven Chorus. It's like Cryptolith, right? But it costs two more, and it's better. Uh, you may look at the top card of your library in time. You may cast creature spells from the top of your library. Creatures you control have tapped add one mana of any color. So obviously when you're making a bunch of coma, coma coils all the time, um, all of those, it, that is ramp. Those become mana. So every rotation of the table, you're ramping four more mana. And that's, that's like the floor of the potential. Whereas if you're making several more because you have multiple upkeeps or you have multiple comas or you have Adrix and Nevs or you have parallel lives, you'll make way more, which can then tap for more mana too, right? So, um, yeah. And then we all know Birds of Paradise, Eryxmethes, Mystic Reflection. Yeah, we just talked about that. Merrileaf, Pixie, Overgrown Battlement. I, I'm... I'm still waiting to like really uh, play with this one. I'm, I feel like there's no way that it can't be good, but if I get this and then if I make copies or multiple copies of it, then the, it's just exponential mana, right? The, these all are gonna just tap for, I guess the I guess a better version of this would be like, I think I already have it in the deck, which is Circle of Dreams. Yeah, Circle of Dreams Druid. So, um, then Storm of Saruman, which we glanced at. Storm of Saruman, Storm. So, Storm of Saruman. It's Ward 3, so it's really hard to get rid of. It's already an enchantment, and so enchantments, unless it's like destroy all enchantments or all opponents' enchantments or exile all opponents' enchantments, this is going to be very, very hard to get rid of because you can't just 
target this with a cross and grip like you 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 have to then pay an additional three mana which is quite a bit um and whenever don't sleep on ward ward is so good i see ward just i mean it's it's i so where is this guy at oh gosh i'm not gonna remember his name off the top of my head he but he's in this deck here He's in, uh, he's in here, and he is, where are you at? I think it's Unsettled Mariner. So Unsettled Mariner, whenever you or a permanent you control becomes a target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, counter that spell or ability unless its controller pays one. That's basically Ward. And uh, I saw this thing... I mean, it, it, it's almost as good as a Dramoka. Dramoka. Um, gosh, why am I misspelling that? Dramoka. I had it right the first time. So, Dragonlord Dramoka. Your opponents can't cast spells during your turn. Almost as good as Dramoka with how it actually played and it costs way less to play it but anyways whenever you cast your second spell each turn copy it so now we're doubling we're twin casting our second spell every turn so if i have if i if i start getting copies of this then i mean you can see like that's pretty disgusting Very, very fun stuff. All uh, right. So I'm not a fan of like regular counter spells. I like counter spell, um, force of will, pact of negation, uh, gift you offer you can't refuse. I'm just going to try and run through, um, swan song, um, etc like these they're, they're so lame they're so lame when you could do desertion counter target spell if an artifact or creature spell is countered this way put that card on the battlefield under your control instead of its owner's graveyard so this i i wonder I feel like because it's going from the stack to the battlefield, if that if this was a commander, they might be able to put it back in the command zone. I'd have to look at that. But actually, why not? Does work against commanders. The replacement effect on desertion is self-replacement. Some replacement effects are not continuous effects so your opponent gets it wow so you can so you so that's a big difference right <clears throat> if you counterspell something if you counterspell a, a commander then it just it's just going to cost two more mana so you lose a card you pay two mana and then their commander goes back into their command zone and then they can just they still have access to it and they're just going to pay two mana so they don't lose a card and they're having to pay as much mana as you had to pay and you lost a card like counter spells trash man and, and unless you're playing like competitive or a deck that wants to counter spells like brawl then i just don't see a reason to to play those crappy counter spells um, the other one that I really, and I wonder if I have it, it would be, I usually run it here. So it's in my, it's in my tribal, it's in my Ur Dragon deck. Um, did I put it up here? Hold on. Maybe it's here, but it's up here. Yes, yeah, Spell Swindle. Spell Swindle. So I was playing against my sons yesterday, and I left five mana. Um, it was almost like... 
it was almost like like the way <laughs> so the way I think about magic is that it's like you're casting the spells and it's actually happening like this is your spell book you're slinging the spell and then what like it's physically happening so in my mind's eye this is how this went my son tried to play old Nabo. I'm not gonna look it up because you should know <laughs> you probably already, well whatever so old Nabo. So old Nabon, he's whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, create that many treasure tokens. So if you attack with everything and it's like 20 power, you could get 20 treasures, right? So he just makes a ton of treasures. Well, my son on like turn five, he played, he had ramped. It was like four or five. He'd ramped enough that he was going to go for old Nabon on turn four or five well i saw that he had like had he done he'd come up to this point in the game and he had six or well he, he had seven mana he had six mana but he had her dragon in the command zone to make it one less to cast so he went to cast old Nabone, and so i had left all my mana open and i spell swindled it so i set him back a card I set me back a card, but I gained seven turns advantage in terms of mana. That's enormous. That's game winning stuff. Counterspell is like a normal counterspell, force of negation, force of will. That is, you're delaying the game. Card for card card for two cards in in the case of force of will and you're just you've delayed the game and you set your, yourself back a card or two and usually and so if it's not force of will mana whereas for me i spend five mana to invest into seven into ramping seven mana so i'm going from five mana on turn five to 12 mana on turn six or five mana on turn four to twelve mana on turn five. The, that that's enormous. So it it just I'm just like pleading my case of like I don't understand why you would want to play a normal counterspell because what how do how do people counter counterspell? Everybody everybody that listens to this command zone knows how people counter counterspell. You just play into it. You have to. Because if you don't play the card, it's like they countered the card. You've heard you've heard Jim Wong, you've heard um, Josh Lee Kwai explain this. So if you're just if people are just going to play into your counters anyways, they're like, well, you might have a counter, you might not, but I'm not going to let you counter my spell just by me not playing it. I'm going to play. It. That's how good players play. Am I wrong? So they're going to play the big spell regardless. So when you see the big mana, just chill. They're going to play it. They're going to play it. And the floor of this card is you counter a spell and you're still ahead. So the very the floor of this card is you counter a spell, you get one treasure. You still go to your next turn and have a treasure, throw down a land. You're still, you're still up a turn in terms of mana. It's a ramp card. You play Spell Swindle. If you are holding Mana Drain as a counterspell, you are playing Mana Drain incorrectly. When you're building your deck, Mana Drain should be right here. I could easily take Spell Swindle, take out Migration Path, and put Spell Swindle here. And have another card slot for, for something that's, that's whatever. Does that make sense? So just like just just think about that. Mana drain, if I have mana drain in my deck, it is is more than likely not going in my control package. It's gonna go into my ramp. Especially so the so like the way I built uh, Adam Zanala deck. Mana drain is in the ramp of the deck and especially because in this deck he can get this card out of the graveyard multiple times and play it 
multiple times, right? Because he has a uh, he has that is it guy. He has um, Snapcaster Mage. I think this was supposed to be Snapcaster. Maybe it was dual caster. I shouldn't mess with it. But um, so that's 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 the tangent. That's the point. Is this could if I'm playing mana drain, I'm playing mana drain on turn two or three. I don't care. Whatever the biggest spell or what I think is probably going to be the biggest spell from my opponents, that's the spell that I'm countering. Because then when it comes to my turn, I'm going to be ahead three, four, five mana on my turn. That's how you that's how you ramp in blue. I'm just gonna Okay, so anyways, off off the heroic intervention, hidden strings we talked about, twin cast. Um so I have this here because and I think I already talked about it, but I'll briefly again. Twin cast is a game winning card. Save it for a game-winning play. Don't just play it on like a, a migration path or um, Sky Shroud's claim or what's the what's that Croson one? So what, what's the um... oh gosh? I know I have them. I'm just trying to think. Of... Yeah, Kodama's Kodama's reach. Okay, so so if you have Kodama. Kodama's Reach. You play Kodama, and then you twin cast Kodama. And you're like, ah, that's a pretty good play. Yeah, that's pretty good. I got a, I get, I get two lands in play, two lands in my hand. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. An opponent plays Kodama. I twin cast. I'm like, I need, let me get that ramp over here. And it, hey, in a desperate situation when you really need lands or you're missing land drop or whatever, then go ahead. I'm not saying you absolutely can't under any circumstance, but what I am saying is when somebody plays a Genesis wave, X equal to 42, and you twin cast that, that becomes that exact copy of their twin cast x equal to 42 that's game winning stuff that is a game winning play for two mana he spent 45 mana you spent two yours resolves first you win the game it happens it happens a lot someone plays exsanguinate like someone plays torment of hellfire someone plays delayed fireball or or fire blood, whatever, like like a sorcery that's just gonna win the game. So I'm gonna place expropriate twin cast. Someone plays insurrection twin cast. <laughs> Maybe not insurrection. I, circumstances would dictate that one. But like if I have like a mirage mirror in play, and this is why mirage mirror for me is like my pet card that goes in basically every single deck. If you're running an Anala deck with Phyrexian, with the Phyrexian Altars or Ashnon's Altars or whatever, you try to Insurrection, I might pay two mana, copy your Insurrection, pay two mana, turn this into your Altar, get all the creatures, sack them, and then you get nothing. Cool. Right? So it's stuff, it's stuff like that. Um, all right, so Dismiss in a Dream absolutely amazing card super amazing each creature your opponent controls is an illusion in addition to its other types and has when this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability sacrifice it so obviously when i'm making coma coils this says when i'm making like 20 coma coils and this says sacrifice a serpent tap i can have it tap target permanent then with dismiss in, in the dreams in play that doesn't just make you tap that permanent you can't activate its abilities it also makes you sacrifice it so now i'm turning all of my comas into sac creature i sac a creature targeting one of your creatures you have to sacrifice that creature 
So it's not quite like an edict because it's not like a grave pact where it, I have to target it. So if you have hexproof and stuff, then then you can you can dodge it that way. But um, it's game changing for sure. Gilded Drake, Gilded Drake. If you don't know, fun card, expensive card. Um, when Gilded Drake comes into play, exchange control of Gilded Drake for target creature one of your opponent's controls or sacrifice Gilded Drake. So when you play Gilded Drake, so if my opponent has an Auton Soldier, I play Gilded Drake. I give him Gilded Drake, he gives me Auton Soldier. I play Gilded Drake, uh, he gives me Cosmos Ser Como Cosmos Serpent, I give him Gilded Drake. So then if I have things that can copy Gilded Drake, put into play for me, then here you go. You can have a Gilded Drake, I'll take that. You can have a Gilded Drake, I'll take that. You can have a Gilded Drake, I'll take that. You can have a Gilded Drake, I'll take that. And when I can make tons of tokens, I can take tons of things. And just like you get a bunch of drakes, I get all your stuff. Could I mean could be bad, could be good. Um, Perplexing Chimera is similar but way better. <laughs> so I had a game where I I've had a couple of games actually where I've made several copies of Perplexing Chimera. So it's a lot of text, it's kind of confusing, so I'll explain it. But here's the text. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may exchange control of Perplexing Chimera and that spell. If you do, you may choose new targets for the spell. So what happens in this deck is I make a ton of copies of Perplexing Chimera. Let's just say like 12. And then my opponent tries to play their commander. I'm like, all right, cool. Here, you can have a Chimera. I get your commander. And they're like, okay, I'm gonna play expropriate. Okay, I'm gonna, you can have a chimera. I'm playing expropriate. I'm playing. Let me, I'm gonna play rise from dark realms. Here, you can have a chimera. I'm playing rise from the dark realms. Your rise from the dark realms is my rise from the dark realms. So you just keep. You can just steal spells. It's like countering. It's it's kind of like desertion, but it's a creature. And in this deck, you can make tons of copies of it, and then just steal everybody's play. Um, I, I have, like I said, I, I haven't played this in my playgroup yet, but I could see people just being like, how many perplexing chimeras do you have? Cause first thing that's going to happen, I'm going to play perplexing chimera. My playgroup probably isn't going to know how that card works. Like they're going to be like, okay, I don't understand that, but whatever. Then they'll go to their turn. They'll try to play some stuff and I'll be like, here, have a chimera. That's my spell. And then they'll be like, wait, what? How many of those do you have? And I'm like, oh, I have. Um, you know, this amount, whatever. And what's funny is then they get Perplexing Chimera. So when somebody else plays a spell, they they can then steal their spell. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's hilarious. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then Verity Circle. Um, I don't know. It's It's okay. I'm not like in love with this card, but it's okay. Basically says, enchantment, whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped, if it isn't de being declared as an attacker, you may draw a card. Oh, wow. See, I thought it would even work for declaring a tap. Oh, well, I guess that is being, you may, because it's may. Maybe it's, yeah, it's probably too strong if it's for, um, them declaring it as an attacker, but but a lot of people run a lot of you know like me, Birds of Paradise, Circle of Dreams, Druid, Silvala, creatures that you know they're they're tapping for the ability, whether it's mana, whether it's you know doing something. Um, I get to draw a card every time for those. I can pay five mana to tap a creature without flying, and then I can also just sacrifice a. A, so now I, it turns into I sacrifice a coma coil, I tap your thing, I draw a card. So it just adds another thing to what I'm already going to want to do when I'm sacrificing a serpent to turn off your cards and then I get cards in return. So, so it is very good. It definitely is good. And I think um, even though I could keep going, I, I think I'm probably going to 
chill on that, maybe. I guess I could just talk about these briefly. So this is a creature that taps for three mana that you can only use for creatures. This is ramp uh, to get lands. This is all my creatures tap for a mana of any color. This is uh, tap, get green mana equal to how many creatures you control. Copy enchantment is I can, I can copy any enchantment. Um, bribery is I go into your deck. Steal a creature, put it into play under my control. So I put that, I put it into ramp just because, I mean, I honestly have a bunch of ramp that's up here as well. So I could, I could really like move Marleaf from here, put it there, put bribery up there. It's whatever. Um, yeah. And then sculpting steel, I can copy your, you know, I can copy your, um, Bootlegger's Stash, I could copy your Soul Ring, I could copy your Arcane Signet, or I could copy your, um, God, there was something crazy that I copied the other day. Oh, no, I'm thinking of, I was playing Phyrexian Metamorph. Actually, am I playing Phyrexian in this deck? I really should be doing that instead of... Okay, I do have it. Okay, good. Because that, yeah, so I played Phyrexian Metamorph and I copied an old, old, uh, old Nava. So that's why I choose Sculpting Steel over Soul Ring. Because Soul Ring is not a game breaking, game winning card. If I get it early, great, I become the arch enemy. Everybody dog piles on me. And then if I get it late, it's kind of like, eh. I, I'm netting one mana, but in a deck like this, when, I mean, you're going to have so much mana anyways from like like a Cryptolith Rite or an Elven Chorus already. So being able to use a Sculpting Steel instead because I'm abusing the fact that everybody else is going to run Arcane Signets and, and mana, uh, mana Vaults, etc., etc., I'm abusing the fact that you are using those things, that my other three opponents are probably using those things. But if if it's in the late game, I can sculpt and steal and copy target artifact, which could be a Dark Seal Forge. It could be a um, a Chromeless Memorial. It could be, you know, it could be something way, way, way more game changing. Um, a bootlegger stash. Then, uh, then a soul ring. So that's why I would, I would always nine times out of ten, I would run sculpting steel over a soul ring. Um, Shaman of Forgotten Ways. Let's take a look at this guy. This is a, this is a card that can win the game. This can close the game out. It's three for a two three. Tap it. Add two mana in any combination. Spin this to cast creature spells. Each or you can pay 11 mana. Each player's life total becomes the number of creatures he or she controls. Activate this ability only if creatures you control have total power 8 or greater. So in this deck, you could very well... I mean, you got thousands, thousands of creatures. You could change your life total to 1,000. You could change their life total to potentially zero. If they have no creatures, right? <laughs> so, um... Skyshroud Claim, Gyre Engineer, just man, this gets land, this is a creature. That, I tried to stick with um, things like Gyre Engineer in this deck because it's a copy deck, it, it copies creatures. So if I have this in play and I can make a copy of it, you know, and I could potentially make multiple copies of it, then I'm getting multiple, I'm ramping for multiple mana instead of if I just go and get, you know, um, a forest and an island, it's always just going to be a forest and an island. Now, the 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 trade-off is if there's a board wipe, I'm, you know, most people don't run land destruction, then I won't lose it. But on the other hand, you know, if you're playing Risk It for the Biscuit, Gyre Engineer, you're going to get a lot more a lot more mileage out of. And we just talked about, about Phyrexian Metamorph. This can be a copy of 
you know, a draw card. It could be a copy of a creature that that helps draw it. Could, and and then again, if I just don't need those things because I already have an elemental bond in play or whatever the case may be, then Fire Axiom Metamorph could be something completely crazy because it's not just my stuff that it's copying. It can copy your stuff. It can copy your... I think the other night I copied a, uh, a Maskwood Nexus <laughs> and then I copied like a Sliver Hive Lord <laughs> and made all my stuff indestructible. Like this stuff, the copy stuff, copy and chain copy art bag fire to me like this is the stuff mirage mirror i live for this because my deck is going to do super strong stuff by itself just playing with itself but this person's playing this deck that person's playing that deck that person's playing that deck i can also take your really nice stuff and make it make my stuff exponential as well if I'm stealing, if I'm casting Phyrexian Metamorph and, and casting it on your old Gnawbone, and then I go to attacks with my tons of Coma Coils, like, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, it, it gets crazy. It gets crazy. <coughs> By itself, it gets crazy. But because I'm playing where I can copy other people's stuff, it, it makes it it makes the possibilities endless that's what like if i was gonna play a deck and, and I, I could only play one deck it would probably be this deck because this deck is is so is so many other decks i i get to play so many other decks when i'm playing this deck if that makes sense like i can play your deck with my deck I can steal your stuff. I can play your stuff. I can copy your stuff. I can make multiple copies of your stuff. Even if your stuff is legendary, I can make multiple copies. Like I can play your your a better version of your deck with my deck. That's what I love about it. Um, and then of course, Distant Melody, Shamanic Revelation. Those are similar. Kindred Discovery, super good. Tribute to the World Tree. Oh right. So tribute to the World Tree. So, and remember, any of these enchantments we can copy with with Astral Dragon, except for, and this actually made me really, really sad. But first, let me, let me just finish. So this one says, whenever you creature enters the battlefield, power three or greater. Sorry, it's making me, like, pretend like I'm playing. Um... Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card if its power is three or greater. So every time that we make a coma coil, we, we draw a card. So every rotation on the table, at, at the floor, four draws. We get four extra draws. Plus our draw, five draws. It's, a, it's almost all, an entire new hand if, if coma's in play with the tribute to the world tree. And then otherwise put two plus one plus one counters on the creature if it's not... A, a three three or bigger so really good draw card um <clears throat> the elemental bond is very very similar the downside with elemental bond that i found in this deck <laughs> is elemental bond says whenever a creature with three or greater enters the battlefield under control draw a card it is not a may so be careful because you could very easily deck yourself in, in this deck. I've, I've done it. Uh, all right. So the Great Hinge, play play a, cre a non-token creature, draw a card. Um, it's mana. It's So it's it's also more ramp. Um, yeah, it's just a super good card. If you don't know the Great Hinge, you know, here you go. So pretty easily um, you're going to get the, and, and so, so if we look at this deck, we have our 10 ramp on top of that. We have, this is ramp, this is ramp, this is ramp, this is ramp, this is ramp. So uh, this has potential to be ramp. This has potential to be ramp. This is ramp. Um, 
ramped. Mirage Mirror has potential to be ramped. Clever Impersonator has potential to be ramped. Spark Double has potential to be ramped. Sakshima, Auton, Quantum, Double Major. These, these, I mean, I could keep going, right? Like, I have a lot of potential ramp also. So the Great Hinge being here, it's just another thing that's going to help my deck be super consistent on mana, but it's also a draw card. So it's ramp and draw, but it's primarily in the deck as a draw card. Um, it's just a great, it's just always a great include. And then, of course, if I have like a Sakashima of a Thousand Faces in play, or I have a Mirror Box in play, or I have, you know, these things that get rid of the Legendary rule, I could play an Astral Dragon, making multiple copies of the Great Hinge that are 3-3 Flying Dragons. I could, have a, I could have a ton of Great Hinges. And then play a creature, draw a ton of cards, make a bunch of ramp, <laughs> if I had Haze. Um, which is potential with Mirror uh, Mirage Mirror, right? It, it could be Haste. Sculpting, sculpting steel could be a, a Chronos Memorial. Like we can, we can get haste. We can definitely get haste in this deck. Um, Agent of Treachery is in here as a draw card. I, I definitely could move this. Like I could put, I could move this from here, put it up here, and put put something that's more of like a draw card down here. Um, I mean, I could I could put Clever Impersonator down here, Agent of Treachery up here, but Agent of Treachery. So one thing I don't run with Agent of Treachery is uh, the Dead Eye Navigator because I, I hate that combo. But it says whenever Agent of Treachery enters the battlefield, gain control of target permanent. Wow. I just realized you could still land with this. At the beginning of your end step, if you control three or more permanents you don't own, draw three cards. So very easily we, we could definitely... You know, between Gilded Drake and Bribery and um, Fire, uh, uh, where is that? Oh gosh, Gilded Drake, Perplexing Chimera, Agent of Treachery. We could absolutely own multiple of other people's stuff, and even just getting Agent of Treachery and then just copying it with like Stolen Identity, Progenitor Mimic, a plethora of any of these other. Things that can um, create copies, we could steal a bunch. And then if we have multiple agents of treacheries, I don't even think this one's legendary. Positive, you know. So I have multiple agents of treachery. Um, then it's uh, if you control three or more. At the beginning of your end step, if you control three or more permanents, you don't control draw three cards. So if I have multiple agents of treacheries, I draw three cards for each agent of treachery. So if I copied this, I mean, shoot, if I write a replication agent of treachery, so I make one, and then I make five more, I steal six things, and then I draw three cards per, right? So I'm terrible at math. Three, six, nine, um, 18, right? 18 cards at the end of my turn. And I... When is your... Oh gosh, I'm going to look like a huge noob. That's okay. There's no disc. Yeah, I know, I know. It, it doesn't happen in the... And it doesn't happen in the end step. First, if the active player's hand contains more... Next one has eyes. He or she discards enough cards to reduce to reduce. And it doesn't happen in the inset. When does it happen? So does it just happen at the end of your turn? Discard happens in the cleanup step, which is the last step in the end phase. Okay, so that's what I was looking for. So, so if I have Agent of Treachery, just something to be aware of. This is at the beginning of your end step. You draw, you would draw these three cards, but then at the end of your end step, when you go to the cleanup step, you'd have to 
discard to seven unless you have like a reliquary power, which we do. Boom. Um, <clears throat> Titan of Lithara. This obviously works really well with the um, with all the serpents that you're making with Coma. As Titan of Lithara enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. I choose serpent. Whenever Titan of Lithara enters the battlefield or attacks, you draw cards for each other creature you control that shares a creature type with it. If you do, discard a card. So, so you pay, play Titan of Lithara, name serpents, you draw cards equal to the serpents, you discard one, and then if you copied this, or you got multiple of these, you do it for every time. And every time this attacks, you would do it again. So it's kind of like a, it's almost like a Kindred of Discovery on a creature. Kindred Discovery. And then, of course, Rider Replication, Followed Footsteps. I ended up putting in, into the deck that's not in my list. I ended up putting in, and now that I'm thinking about it, I'm probably going to take it back out. Steps. Was it followed? Okay. So followed footsteps, enchant creature, at the beginning of your upkeep, put a token that's a copy of enchant creature on the battlefield. So it's kind of like a progenitor mimic. Put a token that's a copy of enchant creature on the battlefield. So you could cast this on an opponent's creature. At the beginning of your upkeep, you get a copy of that creature. You could cast on your own creature beginning of your upkeep, you get a copy of that creature. Um, what really made me sad about this card and then the other card that I put into the deck is just doing stuff because it's saying it's going to kick me again. Um, is is this card, Curse of Unbinding. So I put Curse of Unbinding in the deck, which I thought would be really fun. So it's a seven mana enchantment or a curse. Enchant player, at the beginning of enchantment player's upkeep, that player reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card. Put that card onto the battlefield under your control. That player puts the rest of the revealed cards into their graveyard. So what I ended up doing with this, when I played with my sons, I had Adrix and Nev, and I had 10 copies of Adrix and Nev. And then I played Astral Dragon. And so then when I made Astral Dragon, I made two copies of Curse of Unbinding. And then because I had so many Adrix and Nevs, I made 4,096 copies of, Aura, of Curse of Unbinding. And I thought it would work this way. So, like, I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, if it's a creature enchantment, it can't enchant a creature because it's on the creature. So whenever, so if you were to turn a an aura, an enchant creature aura, into a creature, into a 3-3 fine dragon, it actually just disappears. It just, it just vanishes. That's how the rules work. So then I was like, well, maybe that doesn't work with enchant player. Well, I was wrong. Which really sucked because if I was able to make 4,096 copies of Curse of Unbinding, I could put, you know, a third of that on this player, a third of that on this player, a third of that on that player, which clearly is going to be way more than 100. And then at the beginning of this, then I pass the turn, goes to this guy's turn, beginning of his upkeep, he basically gives me every creature in his deck, and then he puts all of his the cards in his deck into his graveyard, everything that's left over, and then he would go to his draw step and he'd lose the game. And I thought that was the funniest way to, like, a really cool way to win the game, but I asked the judges, because I wanted to make sure I was doing it right, and they're like, dude, it's Nora. It disappears. It, it would never happen, which made me so sad because there was so much setup to get to that point. It should totally be a a way that you could end the game, and uh, and I was wrong. So pretty sad about it. So I think I'm gonna go through the deck and just take out the enchant 
player stuff and enchant creature stuff because I can't do anything with those with Astral Dragon, which is the reason that I put those in is so I could make a bunch of them with Astral Dragon so I could it would activate a bunch of times like follow followed footsteps or curse of unbinding that I, I could make a bunch of them and then they could do their thing but you can't because it turns them into a creature and when it's a creature it can't enchant anything or it can't enchant things when they're a creature it's not like bestow um which made me pretty sad i'm not gonna lie and then aside from that, um, and I think I actually might be missing this card, and I need to put it into this deck. Uh, so these are all just just the lands, just like uh, green, blue lands, and then forest and islands. But what I would put into this deck in addition is I would probably take out, I don't know, something. Maybe if I decide to take out one of those uh, ones I was talking about earlier, like Bramble Sovereign. Because um, it's really more for the utility than it is for the land. I don't know if I... Like, I'm sure it's fine if I just counted it as a land. We already have Reliquary Tower. Like, I really hate missing the mana that I need. But anyways, it's uh, the Alchemist Refuge. Alchemist Refuge would be huge. I definitely should add this to the deck, which is pay a blue and a green, tap it, get all your stuff gets flash. And then cards get flash. Um, super duper good card. So I probably definitely need to add that to the deck. I need to make a, a list of cards that I need for the next time I order. Um... Yeah, so I think that's going to wrap it up for for today. And the next episode or two, depending, three, whatever, I don't know how many, maybe just one, um, we'll do some solitaire playtesting with the deck and you can see it live and in person of what it actually, you know, what it actually does. So, but until next time, thanks for joining me. Cheers.